Halloween, the night where the veil between life and death is lifted. Although it sounds scary, it is celebrated throughout the world and especially in America. Children dress up as witches, ghosts or any other character they'd like to collect as many candy as they possibly can. It is a night where many kids are looking forward to the entire year. But on October the 31st, 1974, a city named Deer Park, Texas would forever be changed. On that night, the eight-year-old Timothy O'Brien is complaining about a stomach ache after he returned from trick-or-treating that night. Shortly after his complaints, he dies. There was no doubt. A mysterious killer was on the loose. Because who in their right mind would kill an eight-year-old boy? The killer would eventually be known as the Candyman Killer or the man who killed Halloween. Hi everyone and welcome back to a new spooky video. And if you are watching this video, it means that I was able to make three videos for this Halloween season, yay me. And I'm really surprised by myself because I didn't think I would pull it off, but here I am. And it was even extra hard because YouTube deleted my channel uh, on my birthday and it was an accident, uh, which was really <laughs> very stressful but luckily they were able to uh, put everything back together so here i am and i also have a new friend as you can see in my background my background changes a lot because i didn't have my halloween party yet so sometimes i buy a little bit more stuff and this is the last video i'm recording so the whole order of things is really strange but for this halloween i have a new subject for you and this time it's about a murder which happened on Halloween's Eve. And I already gave it away in the intro, but we are gonna talk about the Candyman killer whose real name was Ronald Clark O'Brien. Why did he kill Timothy and what was their relationship? I will tell you all about it in this Halloween special. I will once again warn you that if you're easily scared or upset, uh, it's better to not watch this video or even any of my Halloween videos. They are all really spooky, scary or disturbing. So now that I've warned you, let's begin. Ronald Clark O'Brien was born on October the 19th, 1944 in Houston, Texas, Tennessee. And this is all the information I could find about his early life. He married Dainene O'Brien and together they had two children. I hope I say her name right because I've never heard about this name. Their son Timothy was born in 1966 and their daughter Elizabeth was born in 1969. And Ronald worked as an optician at the Texas State Optical in Sharpstown, Houston. He was also deacon in the Christian Second Baptist Church, which means that you are a member of that church and you do some kind of service for them. He was also part of their choir and he also ran a local bus program. He lived with his family in Deer Park, Texas, which was a city in the Houston Sugarland Bay Town metropolitan area. They seemed like a happy family, but soon that would change. It was October the 31st, 1974, and soon it would be Halloween Eve. The rain was pouring out of the sky, but that did not stop the eight-year-old Timothy's excitement. Even his little sister from five years old, Elizabeth, was very eager to go trick-or-treating that night. It was, of course, a big deal to dress up and knock on people's doors to gather as much candy as you could possibly place in your basket. Their mother, Dainene, wasn't joining them that night. She was visiting a friend, but their father, Ronald, would go with them. He would take them to town so that they could visit more houses and collect more candy. And of course, the children were very excited about the candy. This family was struggling financially, so there wasn't always money to buy candy. Between the years 1969 and 1974, Ronald had changed his job 
21 times. He earned $150 each week with his work as an optician, which isn't really a lot of money, especially when you have to feed for mouths. And I don't think that Dainene had a job because I couldn't really find anything about it and it was rather normal for women to stay at home. So going trick-or-treating was fun that the children could really use. They would be accompanied by Ronald's friend Jim Bates and his two children and they would drive to the city Pasadena which was a town near Houston. They visited several houses and the children had the time of their lives. They followed a special route and it was very crowded. A lot of other children were of course also trick-or-treating with their parents. Everyone was happy and enjoying themselves and it seemed like a great evening. The route was almost finished and there were only a few houses left. Timothy and the other children rang the bell of one of the final houses, but to none avail. Nobody came to open the door. The children were very disappointed and they walked away silently. But Ronald decided to stay and wait at the front door. Perhaps the owner was just a little slow and he would get some candy eventually. He waited there for several minutes until he decided to join the others once again. He came back holding five pixie sticks, which was a tube with sour sweet powder inside. I remember that I also used to eat them, but I think mine was made differently. He said that the owners took their time to come to the front door but that they eventually gave him five pixie sticks to hand out to the children. So he handed each of the children a pixie sticks. The rain was becoming very heavy and they decided to call it a day and they returned to their homes. With their pockets filled with candy the children couldn't complain. They had a very successful Halloween's Eve. Since Ronald had five pixie sticks and there were four children, he gave one of them to a child he recognized from church. When the children came home, they had to go straight to bed. After all, it had been a very long evening and it was way past their bedtime. But of course, Timothy didn't want to go to bed immediately. He asked his father if he could eat some of his candy. After all, Timothy collected so much that he couldn't contain himself. And of course, we all know how it feels because we don't have an expression like as a kid in a candy store for no reason. And it was a good night to make an exception. According to Ronald, Timothy decided to start with the pixie sticks. Timothy complained that it didn't taste sour sweet but rather bitter. After eating the pixie sticks, he went to his bed, but he couldn't sleep because his stomach was aching and he felt nauseous. He walked towards his bedroom door and he yelled downstairs to his father that he wasn't really feeling well. Then he felt the need to puke and he ran towards the bathroom. He reached the toilet and he started vomiting. Ronald ran upstairs and he found Timothy convulsing, which means that he was really shaking very heavily. Ronald claimed that when he picked Timothy up, he was becoming limp in his arms. He took him directly to the hospital, but to none avail. Timothy died on their way to the hospital, not even an hour after he consumed the pixie sticks. The news of Timothy's death was spreading fast. The whole community was going insane. It did not take long before the police found out that the pixie sticks was the murder weapon and that poor Timothy didn't die of any disease but of murder. A pathology report was released and revealed that the pixie sticks had been laced with potassium cyanide which is a fast working and extremely lethal poison and the wrappers of the pixie sticks had been opened and poisoned before being resealed with a stapler. The poison was even enough that it could have killed two adult humans. So it was no surprise that this amount of poison had killed an eight-year-old boy. This information was sent to the police. Parents of the children were scared that their candy was also poisoned. So they took it away from them and handed it over to the police. At first, 
everyone thought that someone was on the loose trying to poison all the children and that this person wanted to kill Halloween forever. And this was also believed by the police. And they took action right away. They started a manhunt as fast as possible to make sure that no other children would fall victim to this child killer. The media was also quick to pick up this story and they dubbed this killer the Candyman Killer. Halloween in Houston was truly becoming a horror film. Eventually the manhunt wasn't really necessary because many eyes already turned to Ronald O'Brien. He was very vague when he was questioned and he did not remember from which house he got the pixie sticks. And this was very strange because the group had only visited a few houses across two streets before the rain started to spoil everything. And none of the houses that they had visited handed out pixie sticks. But Ronald was adamant that he did receive the pixie sticks and that he got it from someone with very hairy arms that only showed his arms when he opened the door. But the owner of that house was an air traffic controller at the William P. Hobby Airport and he was working that night. And he only came home around 11 p.m. which was way after Ronald returned to his home. And that was a few hours after Ronald claimed that he received the pixie sticks. The story didn't hold up and Ronald didn't really seem like a grieving father. But why would he kill his own son? What could be the reason? And if there wasn't any reason, what's the point? Well, the police found out that Ronald was in debt. Hundred thousand of dollars in debt to be exact. But how could he even pay off this debt while he was only earning a hundred and fifty dollars each week? Well, I will tell you. Months before the death of Timothy, Rana took out a $10,000 life insurance policy on his children. And this was not the only time. He kept taking out life insurance policies, bringing the total to $60,000. And this was of course very suspicious. And I think most of you already know this, but you can only use life insurance money once the person on who you have put the life insurance is dead. During their investigation, they found out even more information about Ronald. They discovered that he was a suspect of theft at his job at Texas State Optical and that he was close to being fired. They also found out that his car was about to be repossessed and that the family home had been foreclosed on. He even took out some loans at the bank. This man, was financially ruined, of course, by his own doing. Therefore, the police believed that Ronald killed Timothy and tried to kill Elizabeth, his daughter, so that he could get the life insurance money so that his financial woes would finally be over. Fortunately, Elizabeth and the other children did not eat their pixie sticks yet, although one victim is already one too many. But if he only wanted to murder his own children, why did he give the pixie sticks to three other children? The police also had an answer for that. Of course, he wanted to cover up his tracks so that the whole Candyman killer on the loose story would buy him some time to clear himself from the allegations. But he failed and he was arrested on the 5th of November. The police could not find out where Ronald bought his poison, but they did talk to witnesses and they told them that Ronald was very interested in poison. He had shown an unusual interest in cyanide and he even spoke to an employee of a chemical company in Houston. He would ask people where he could buy poison and how much he needed for a lethal doses. Well, if that wasn't suspicion, I don't know what is. It's really obvious if you ask me. But if you need more proof, they also found a scissor inside his own house with plastic traces of the poisoned pixie sticks on it. There you go. 
during the trial, his own wife rejected the claim that Timothy chose for the pixie sticks as a first choice to eat. She stated that Ronald forced Timothy to choose the pixie sticks. And this was of course a huge red flag. And she wasn't the only family member who spoke against him. His sister and brother-in-law both testified that Ronald had spoken about insurance money during Timothy's funeral. He told them that he was going to buy some stuff and that he was going on a holiday. And this is of course very strange because how can you even think about money when you are burying your child? Of course his defense tried to dispute all these claims. And they mentioned an urban legend of a stranger that handed out candy laced with deadly materials and candy apples with razors inside of them. These stories were well known all around but no evidence was ever found. Ronald was adamant that he was innocent and he never wavered. But all the evidence started piling up and his credibility caved in like a house of cards. The case and trial became very well known throughout America and everyone was waiting patiently to discover what would happen with this Candyman killer. It did not matter how hard the defense worked, it only took the jury 45 minutes to decide Ronald's fate. His verdict came on June the 3rd, 1975 and the jury was unanimous and found him guilty of capital murder and four counts of attempted murder. The prosecutor, Mike Hinton, pleaded for the most severe punishment. He told the jury, the only possible conclusion is that this man killed his own flesh and blood for money. He even shook of anger while he was saying this. He also added the following. Just realize how easy it would be for him to kill a complete stranger for money. We owe it to his potential future victims to cut out this cancer from society. This convinced the jury and the judge and they all agreed that Ronald O'Brien should be sentenced to death by electrocution. Shortly thereafter his wife decided to divorce him. She later remarried and her new husband adopted her daughter Elizabeth. So Ronald was on death row and he was staying in the LS1 unit near Huntsville, Texas. It was said that Ronald was despised by his fellow death row inmates. They could not comprehend why he would murder his own son, even though they did horrible things as well. He had no friends in jail. They even wanted to organize a demonstration on the date of his execution to express their hatred of him. Ronald's first execution date was set for August 8, 1980, but his attorney petitioned for a stay of execution and he succeeded. The date was moved to May 25, 1982, but this date was also postponed. This time it was moved to October the 31st, 1982, which was the 8th anniversary of the crime. But this also didn't go through and the execution was moved a final time to give Ronald a chance to pursue an appeal and seek a new trial. Eventually a fourth date was scheduled, which was on March the 31st, 1984. So around this time he was already in prison for 9 years. Of course his lawyer tried to postpone it again. The law changed and Ronald wasn't going to be electrocuted anymore, but he was going to die by a lethal injection. His lawyer argued that this was cruel and unusual. But his request was denied by a federal judge on March the 28th, 1984. Eventually, March the 31st came around the corner and nothing would stop this execution. Ronald O'Brien was taken to the Huntsville unit to face his fate. His last meal consisted of a T-bone steak, french fries and ketchup, whole kernel corn, sweet peas, lettuce and tomato salad with egg and french dressing, iced tea, sweetener, saltiness, Boston cream pie and rolls. While he was there, a crowd gathered around the facility and some of them even yelled trick or treat to mock him. But he probably couldn't even hear it. 
There were also people who were against the death penalty and they demonstrated with candy. Ronald was brought to the room where he would receive his lethal injection. He remained his innocence until the end. His final words were, what is about to transpire in a few moments is wrong. However, we as human beings do make mistakes and errors. This execution is one of those wrongs, yet doesn't mean our whole system of justice is wrong. Therefore, I would forgive all who have taken part in any way in my death. Also, to anyone I have offended in any way during my 39 years, I pray and ask your forgiveness. Just as I forgive anyone who offended me in any way. And I pray and ask God's forgiveness for all of us, respectively as human beings. To my loved ones, I extend my undying love. To those close to me, know in your hearts I love you one and all. God bless you and may God's blessing be always yours. Ronald C. O'Brien I think it's very strange that he doesn't even mention his children. So that says a lot to me. After his final words, he was injected with the lethal injection. He is buried in Forest Park East Cemetery in Webster, Texas. And Timothy is buried in Forest Park Lawndale Cemetery in Houston. So we've reached the end of the story of the Candyman killer Ronald O'Brien and the death of his son Timothy O'Brien. He was the man who ruined Halloween for many people. And he also ruined the chance for his son to live a long and happy life. And for me it's already hard to imagine how you could kill any person at all, even if you hate that person, but your own child, it's really mind-blowing to me. I can't comprehend it at all. And I hope nobody can comprehend it because otherwise that would be very disturbing. And he did not only try to kill one of his children, but both of them just for money. I mean, I would give all my money if I had a child just for my child to live. And I wouldn't even come in a situation like he did. Of course, we don't know the whole story. Perhaps he was really desperate. But even if you're desperate, you don't do things like that. You try to search for help. Ask people around you to help you. And never pile up all those bills. Because once you're in one debt, it's very easy to come in another. And just don't do it. I really wonder if you think he got what he deserved. I always have a hard time when it comes to death penalty because in my country, the Netherlands, we don't have it for, well, I think maybe a hundred years we don't have it anymore. And it's also strange because the justice system in America is really different from here. I know a girl in my town was murdered and the person who killed her, and she was 10 years old, he only got 15 years. And so, which means she was murdered in 2001 or two. So he's already free for many years. But if you murder one person in America, it's, it's possible that you get a life sentence. So it's really difficult for me to imagine uh, that you can sentence someone to death. Anyway, let me know your opinion and let me know what you thought about this video. For this spooky season I have one video left and I will upload it on the 31st of October and it will be about werewolves. I really hope you're gonna watch it and if you enjoyed this video please give me a like and if you liked even more you can also subscribe to my channel. Sorry for my voice, I have a throat infection for three weeks now but I don't want to skip my videos, I just want to give you some content. So thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you the next time. Bye!